The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's WCET webcast, Organizing and Supporting Successful Multi-Institution Consortia. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorships here at WCET. We have a lot of content to get through today, but we will have plenty of time for your questions and answers. If you have any questions at any time, go ahead and enter them into the question box. And you can access the PowerPoint slide in the handout pane. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sure to send you a link to the recording, any resources that are shared, and the PowerPoint. If you'd like to follow along on our Twitter back channel, you can also ask questions there. The hashtag is WCET webcast. Today we'll move through brief introductions of our speakers. We'll talk about each consortium, have a moderated discussion, share lessons learned, and then get to your questions. Again, enter those into the question box. We'll hold those till the end of the presentations and then get to your responses. We have a wonderful moderator today, Kevin Corcoran, who is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium. I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Kevin. Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am one of the co-chairs of WCET's eLearning Consortium Group, along with WCT's own Russ Poulin and Tina Parscale, who's the Executive Director of the Colorado Community Colleges Online. Personally, I've had the opportunity to be part of this community since 2012 and really have been able to embrace and learn quite a, a bit from my colleagues around collaborative efforts and inter, uh, institutional partnerships. And just a quick plug for WCET, uh, the eLearning Consortia Group convenes on an annual basis at the annual WCET event. And so hopefully you'll be able to join us this October 23rd in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is the first of a series of three webcasts uh, focusing on interinstitutional partnerships and consortia. I'm extremely excited to be moderating today's webinar focusing on business models of consortia that are a wonderful mix of long-standing organizations, recently restructured organizations, and a fairly new consortia representing not only state and provincial, but also private governance. Just to, to get right into it, uh, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce today's speakers. And so what I'll do is I'll go through each speaker and then um, we'll transition. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Thomas Galuli, the Executive Director of Higher Learning Partners at Regis University. Joining Thomas will be John Opper, the Director of Distance Learning and Student Services at Florida Virtual Campus. And last but not least, Lena Patterson, Senior Director of Programs and Stakeholder Relationships at eCampus Ontario. Each speaker will be starting with about a 10 minute overview to provide some structure and background on their organization and then we'll transition to question and answers. With that, I'd like to introduce Thomas Galuli and hand the mic over to Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you, Kevin, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we do and, and who we've been doing it for. Uh, once again, I think we only have 10 minutes each, as Kevin said, so want to want to be brief but not go through it too fast so we can get to it. Uh, a little history um, on the OCICU Consortium, or the Online Consortium of Independent Colleges and Universities. This was founded back in 2005, and originally it was called the Regis Consortium. Regis University has a long history of distance learning, everything from uh, doing the University Without Walls back in the 1960s and 70s, where we actually did, uh, we mailed syllabuses and, and information out to students that worked in Denver and did things by mail, all the way to doing broadcasts at TV stations, believe it or not, with professors uh, doing lessons or lectures, and then once again, mailing out VHS tapes, all the way to the evolution of online learning. And early and often, Regis was, uh, was entrepreneurial in spirit, uh, not only for uh, our own institution, but also with all the partnerships that we had uh, in regard to just education period. How could we deliver content at a uh, at a different at a different level other than the face to face? Um, so what happened was we just got into online learning, and early said, you know what, we're we're very good at this, um, but what we're finding is we're not filling all of our seats. So the original the original thought was, why don't we go to some of our partner institutions? and look at seeing if we can get them to get into online learning by offering them guest seats 
in some of our courses. Uh, the students who then become guest students on our learning management system, we give them all the same support, we give them all the same uh, information as if they were a typical Regis student. And Regis was called the providing institution and the institutions that we, that we brought into the fold as guests uh, were the member institutions. And so a department was founded, it was called New Ventures at the time, it's now Higher Learning Partners of Regis University. Uh, but we found uh, we found great success in this, and we also had uh, a number of failures. Um, it was labor intensive. We were uh, exchanging registrations with multiple institutions, and you can imagine some of the chaos it, it caused with uh, with starts and deadlines and support services for the students. Uh, how were the conversations being set up? Really, an operational um, challenge for the department to try to figure out how we could streamline this because at the time we did not have a software solution in place. We simply were doing things very manually. So uh, we also had uh, a number of inputs where we let uh, some of the members, some of the original members of the consortium, we called charter members, and we had individuals that were weighing in on decisions in regard to the, the use of the consortium, the rules for entry, uh, how was it governed, what were, the, uh, what were the changes and how would that happen, what was the pricing. So along the way, although we found some initial success, we, we failed um, quite a bit. Um, and what we came to find out was that we needed to put something in place that would allow us to grow. Um, so originally, the history of the consortium was founded as Regis as a providing institution, i.e. we would have an online accounting course with 20 seats that we were paying our professor to teach. And we found out historically we were only getting 12 Regis students. So there's eight seats to fill guest students coming from other schools. That grew. Uh, eventually where we decided that we needed to get a software system in place. Uh, we developed a software system and the, the software system, the consortium and all things originally were, were part of a collective effort where people were coming together. Um, once again, the, the Department of Higher Learning Partners and New Ventures was leading the conversation in, in trying to organize it, but ultimately we took a lot of input from the partner schools on what they found most important during the registration process, what were the things they found that were critical, that they needed for support services, what would be kind of the uh, bare minimum for a providing institution that they would have to have in place in regard to online learning and the capabilities that they had to support the students that were equal to what Regis was providing. So in the very beginning, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, uh, really just a lot of uh, uh, leadership taking place. And we almost had too many cooks in the kitchen, so to say. Uh, we decided who, who would it serve and why? And so uh, what were some of the things that came out of those discussions was that we needed an independent uh, group to govern uh, the, the consortium. Uh, Regis was founding it, so we put that in place with the, with the leadership group, number one. Number two, what was the mission of it, right? We wanted to make sure that there's something where there was a revenue share between all the schools uh, that were participating in it to cover that tuition, but also putting a revenue model in where, where schools could actually make money doing this while also serving students and getting what they needed done, but not to cannibalize their own offering. Um, and, and why were we doing this? Uh, back to the mission. We wanted to help other schools. We wanted to help them come up with the um, into the online world and be successful in it. And we, we designed a way that would be low risk uh, and uh, but but high reward by putting the consortium together. So currently, uh, to date, since 2005, we're currently going on our 13th year. Um, we have roughly, right now, I believe 75 schools in the consortium, but we've had as many as 100 in the partnership. Uh, we've recently done the math. We've facilitated or cross-facilitated through the software system that we developed that's proprietary to us, uh, 30,000 enrollments. Uh, we have generated, in the 13 years, uh, over $24 million in new revenues for the partner schools because these are these are courses or these were seats that were um, that were leaving the reservation, so to say. These were students that were needing to get a course done. They couldn't find it on their home institution, so they were they were going somewhere else to do it, um, and the school was losing the revenue. And to date, we've we've served over 19,000 students. So the way that it's funded, um, the way that this the way that this is put together, uh, once again, the the leadership group. We are a department of Regis University, Higher Learning Partners of Regis manages or we are the managers of the consortium so we developed the bylaws we developed the the rules um, of the consortium and how it works and before we sign on the school we make them fully aware of of how it operates how the revenue was split and how the um how a new school can come aboard to eventually become a provider right for a school that may have 
little to no online capabilities, how they can grow from simply being a, a user of the consortium and uh, a user of the online seats that are available in the catalog, which has 1,200 courses right now through 10 providing institutions that open up their seats to one day also becoming a provider or an online um, provider, not only for their own institution, but possibly for the consortium as well. So when people ask, what do we do? Um, just a brief quote for the management piece, uh, HLP guides member institutions to seamlessly share courses, credits, and tuition while helping them expand their degree programs and access new enrollments with revenue with no upfront investment. So uh, a very brief description of how the consortium works, but ultimately uh, we've told people if you can picture perhaps even an Airbnb or an Uber model, on one side we have the universities that have uh, multiple backgrounds, different backgrounds. These are these are all faith-driven, uh, not-for-profit, small to medium universities across the country. Uh, but one thing they do have in common is they're very well positioned and, and postured in the online world. Some of the some of the providers that we have are not only Regis University, but Southern New Hampshire University was an original member uh, to provide courses. University Incarnate Word, uh, Saint Leo, just to name a few. Um, so gives you kind of an idea of the exchange of the open market kind of model where universities uh, that are providing could put into the catalog, into the calendar year, the courses that will be made available with the number of seats for the member institutions to shop or to look to see online uh, what they might need. And that way they can be strategic about using the consortium uh, by looking at their own course catalogs or looking at their own enrollments to see, we've got a, a course in accounting that's not online, but typically it's got three or four students. So why are we holding that when we can faculty load push the students to the consortium and actually cash flow positive with very little operational cost. So the way that we're funded, or just some of the, excuse me, some of the things that the we we seek to grow um, in the consortium is obviously stronger e-learning capabilities, some of the services that we provide um, behind the expansion of the use of the consortium is once again, like I said, we've got some schools who eventually say we've been using the consortium, we like online, um, we have earmarked the funds that we've earned off using the consortium. We'll talk about the revenue model in a second. But what we want to do is eventually build our own online programs. And so Higher Learning Partners goes in and acts as if um, almost kind of like an un-OPM. Uh, we go into university universities since we're a department of Regis, and we actually help them build their own online programs in a consulting nature. Much like the providers we currently have, we've helped bring them along uh, with services where we help uh, either do course design for them or we do curriculum mapping all in the online world. We actually go in and do online faculty readiness. We do assessments uh, for, the uh, for the institution all the way from strategic financial and or IT planning, everything revolving around one day producing an online program for their own institution, all the way to marketing and even moving towards investing uh, in some of these institutions in their marketing efforts to help them launch their online program. So all the things that eventually lead to self-sustainability. We want them to one day be able to fish for themselves. Um, we want to be able to get them in a position where they can, like I said, not only provide for their own institution, but if they'd like, they can actually market and provide for the consortium as a whole, which is, they said, over 75 schools nationwide. <clears throat> so just a, a quick um, diagram of how it works, uh, the flow of of the information and or the registrations. On the left side, you've got the providing institution, i.e. Regis, St. Leo, uh, Southern New Hampshire University, where they've got empty seats. Um, they've got the faculty teaching it, they've got the content, and they've got the grading. In the middle of the consortium sits HLP and or the managers of the consortium, where we own the software, where the cross-registration takes place. We call it the secure management system. Um, we have the administrators, we manage the course catalogs, we do all the billing, we do all of the um, decisions as far as uh, if there's any changes in the consortium through the bylaws. So this way we're quicker to action so we don't get bogged down in bureaucracy. And on the other side, you've got the members and the number of reasons why they might be using the online catalog. Maybe it's um, the, the, they have athletes that need courses. Um, they've got summertime credits that have been lost to traditional uh, community college type of ventures where they really want to keep the students on campus and understand what courses they're taking. Uh, they've got a student that wants to graduate and they simply don't have the course available for, for a full semester past what, what the student might be graduating on. Uh, teaching out courses where they're, they are simply trying to sunset something out. Um, and it's all done through the advising structure. This is, this is done through a liaison at each university uh, where the leadership has 
pre-selected the courses they would like to pre-approve uh, for the university students to use. And then the advising structure allows the students to register based on those courses that have been pre-approved. If a student wants a course that's outside of that pre-approved list, uh, each university has got a structure in place. But why this is important is because it allows for scalability. So you've got multiple universities on one side that are completely different. This isn't part of a, uh, a national or a state type of structure where you, you've got um, you know, 30 colleges that are all part of the same system, that have all the same grading, that have all the same content, right? This gives an opportunity for the member institutions and provider institutions through the advising structure, through the leadership to pre-approve the courses to make sure that it matches up, i.e., are you a university that likes Regis and their mission and what they say and the content, the example of the courses and who's teaching them? And pretty soon over time, uh, many of the member institutions become very familiar with the providing institutions on what they provide, the quality, uh, the content, um, even the scheduling uh, that may fall in line with their own. So it's, it's really kind of a matching game, so to say, over time where they become very um, uh, comfortable with the provider's uh, information. So the revenue share, this was important. Um, how could we make this uh, a model where everybody wins? Um, and so without going through all of the different uh, flowchart pieces here, uh, I'll explain it very as simple as I can. But ultimately, in the, in the not-for-profit private uh, institutional, or institutional world, uh, the average cost for a three-credit course is roughly $1,500. Uh, what we've done is we have set pricing for consortium courses to be offered by the providers at $825 for an undergraduate course and $1,000 for graduate courses. So if you're, a, um, if you're an Incarnate Word student and you want to take a course at Regis University and you want to use one of the courses that's on the consortium catalog on the secure management system or the software system, what you would do is you would submit a registration request, enrollment request, we would take that enrollment request push it to Regis for Incarnate Word. Once it's granted uh, and the student becomes a guest student of Regis University, they become a student on the Regis University's learning management system. The way that the billing works is past the drop ad period, nine days after the fee is earned, the student pays Incarnate Word for that course. They pay him full price, $1,500, as if it was Incarnate Word's own course. We have helped Incarnate Word uh, do course coding to make sure that that accounting course they might be taking at Regis University is actually coded as their own, even though they are taking it at Regis with a Regis professor and Regis support services on the Regis LMS. The billing, the student actually pays Incarnate Word that $1,500 for that course. Incarnate Word, once the drop ad period is complete and the fee is earned, pays the consortium the discounted price of $825 for that course. Regis University's higher learning partners, or as the managers of the consortium, we take a 30% management fee of that 825, and the 577 and change that's left uh, at the end goes to the provider to fill that empty seat they made available. So in this model, everybody shares the revenue on the initial financial aid package and or funds that the student would normally just pay straight to Incarnate Word. So a split right down uh, not quite down the middle, but based on the needs at the time and the financial model that was originally put together, um, the split was agreed upon between the providers and the members and the management team. That way, what happens is the members now actually can cash flow positive by sending their students someplace else, not to cannibalize their own offering. If they've got that course on campus, certainly we want them to, to send their student and keep them on campus. But if this was a case where the um, the student was going to go someplace else to get that credit done or couldn't graduate in time, or for some of our members, um, they simply want to go ahead and, and do a faculty load and, and kill the low enroll, the independent study, the summertime offerings that they don't have available. They can use this as a cash flow positive model because they don't have the operational cost behind teaching the course. The providers are thrilled about it because they are operating at 100% capacity. So just to kind of give you some of the registration flow, um, many of these things were things that we worked out early when we started talking about some of the troubles in operations when we were doing an exchange of the information via email, uh, Excel spreadsheet, and uh, phone calls. Um, 
when we built the secure management system, once again, the software system that manages the cross-registration model, it is proprietary to our department. We came up with a flow that allowed for uh, a registration operation that could be scalable, right? Because on one side of the house, you've got the providers. On the other side, you've got the members. It doesn't matter how many we add to the consortium because the flow stays the same. It's a manageable, scalable operation. Having a management team sit in the middle because all of the enrollments and the process there uh, within the consortium are the same regardless of member or provider or the student in between is taking them. Thomas, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It leads a number of questions for me, and I hopefully the audience has a number of questions. And I'm just going to reiterate what Megan said before. There is a question pod, so please, if you have questions, submit those. And once each presenter has a chance to, to go through their overview, we'll definitely dive into those questions. But without further ado, I'd really like to introduce John Opper and hear what happened, what's going on at Florida Virtual Campus. John, please take it. Well, thank you. Uh, the Florida Virtual Campus uh, is a state-level entity. Uh, we were created in statute uh, most recently in 2012. Uh, there's a section of law there, and essentially they consolidated four separate entities into the, the current Florida Virtual Campus. I should say that e the e-learning organization that I've been a part of for a long, long time, currently the Florida Virtual Campus, had its start back in 1998 and has evolved as the legislature has changed over years and morphed us into various forms and connections and governance models. The current one is uh, the Florida Virtual Campus and established in the statute. Uh, and we are a single point of access for online services, uh, both student services and distance learning. And oversight is provided uh, mostly by the chancellors of the Florida College and State University system but our administrative connection is a little bit different. Uh, I've included a diagram uh, on the next slide that shows you the actual, um, this is an actual document that was used by the legislature to facilitate that consolidation that happened in 20, uh, 2012. They actually just, there was no a lot of text or briefing. This document said it all. Essentially, they said there are four organizations that are web-based at the state level providing services in libraries, distance learning, and student services. And we think there can, can be economies of scale by combining them under one banner, the Florida Virtual Campus. We can consolidate all those IT operations and save a lot of money and provide better service. Uh, I'm not sure that we saved a whole heck of a lot of money. Uh, and it took us a little while from a logic standpoint, it might have seemed logical to combine the IT operations. But when you think about putting all these program and functions all together and making sense in one organization, it did take us a little time to sort that out. Um, essentially, the Florida Virtual Campus is a gateway organization at the state level. It provides support services, access to online teaching and learning and research tools. Uh, and helps institutions as well as students uh, achieve their mission or pursue their degree. Uh, we facilitate cross-institutional collaboration. We are probably one of the very few entities in the state that actually convenes meetings at which all of our institutions actually talk to each other on uh, issues around uh, common uh, concerns. The college system might meet by itself, the universities meet by themselves, but we get them all together. And in many cases, we have our nonprofit private institutions also in the room to talk about policy issues around e-learning and student support services uh, as well. As you might have noticed from the previous slide, we also have under the Florida Virtual Campus, our library organization, the consolidation brought about the uh, pulling together of our community college and state university library organizations into one library organization. And that, uh, that certainly has made for some very interesting partnerships between both us and distance learning and student services and our library operations, particularly these days around e-resources and open educational resources, which is currently a big conversation for us. In terms of funding, uh, and governance. Uh, specifically today, uh, we are administratively housed and a part of the University of West Florida. We have bounced around over the years for various models. I've been part of a community college. I've been part of the University of Florida. I've been at the state level and currently we're attached to the University of West Florida. 
who we get our paychecks from, but the statutory mission that we have remains the same. Um, it's just an administrative connection. Uh, there are benefits to being attached to a university, obviously with research and resources. There are also some takeaways sometimes that happen with being attached to a specific institution. Sometimes the overhead in grants is pretty high. Sometimes getting a legislative budget request out into the general stream, working through a particular governance structure can be challenging. But in most cases, our, we have benefited greatly from being attached to the University of West Florida, and it's worked out quite well for us. Our funding is provided annually by the Florida legislature. We do have some additional revenues that we raise through special activities, sponsorships, conferences, and grants. And all of, as, as many of uh, my other colleagues probably do as well, we have pass-through funds, essentially where we collect funding uh, and pay bills for things that we might do in joint procurement or things that we operate or uh, procure on behalf of our member institutions. Uh, so um, I also included in the slide deck a picture of our current website. One of our biggest challenges with this website was when you think about the four organizations that were uh, pulled together to form the Florida Virtual Campus, the question and the struggle that we have really worked on is trying to take all of the massive amount of information and services and applications and put it behind one website and try to then help users navigate that website to quickly find what, what they want. We have tried role-based, you know, student, adult, parent. We are now working with task-based activities, like you want to go to college, you want to succeed in college, you want to find a career. That's working out fairly well for us, but we're not satisfied. And I think our next step will be really working toward personalization of the student experience. Um, many of our individual institutions already do this, and it's a little bit easier for them because they have a student in their environment and they can serve up a lot of great services. The Florida Shines website is, is working across 40 different institutions all of which are 40 independent IT duchies. And so for us to provide services across all of those institutions, we're connected uh, technically to every one of their systems, and we try as best we can to pull information from them and, and load data to our website to provide the best possible service for our students. Uh, the high school student, for example, might come to our website, and we've kind of looked at this as a journey the student might, all students are trying to start with some kind of planning activity and ultimately reside at the end, which is uh, getting a degree or a job or, or pursuing adult learning. For the high school students, this grid kind of shows the kinds of services, applications, or tools that currently exist on Florida Shines that they might want to use to, to, to achieve what they're trying to do. Find a course, find out how, they're, uh, how close they are to graduation in high school. We currently load all high school transcripts and can pull a, a transcript and put it through an analysis and show the student how close they are to high school graduation, which also gives us a ramp up in helping high school students think about when they need to take the right math if their career goal, for example, is engineering. So a lot of advising functions and a lot of uh, planning functions for high school students start almost in the seventh and eighth grade. And we, we have gotten more and more engaged in working with high school students over the last two years because of that. Um, if you think about the same kind of thing for post-secondary students, uh, which is the next one, uh, similar, kinds of, similar kinds of grid, perhaps a different set of services in a different mix, uh, but a lot of the same services are served up to those students depending upon what they're trying to do. Uh, we also are the, we also are the state, uh, I guess, access for transient student activity. So if a student wants to take a course at another school over the summer or at any time during the year, they can electronically submit that application and we can process it through our workflow and get a student enrolled at another institution and have the grade transmitted back to them. That represents about 70 to 75,000 students a year with probably three quarters of that happening in the summer term for us. Um, our online course catalog contains roughly 52, 53,000 course sections in it. 
and we probably have 700 plus degree programs that students can search through. And we're getting more and more engaged in the processing and dual enrollment for high school students. They think about taking early courses and trying to make the transition into higher education. In terms of our institutional services, uh, we do have quarterly meetings. Each, uh, each institution has two representatives appointed by the president. We meet three times a year uh, and a fourth time in the summer. Uh, as needed, uh, and they, they set the agenda. We talk about a number of things, including updates and do professional development for them across the year with webinars and services. We function as a policy advisory group for e-learning issues for uh, our policymakers and uh, education leadership. We are moving to a quality matters state consortium agreement, a uh, state level agreement. We've had a consortium agreement for years currently have about 26 users of the Quality Matters uh, rubric. And we do a lot of collaborative services and leverage contracting, depending upon what institutions want to purchase. We've bought everything from LMS contracts, Adobe, uh, technology, hardware. At one point, I was listening to uh, uh, just a minute ago, thinking about some of the things we've done over the years, telecourses, satellite transponder time. It just depends upon what our institutions would like to uh, get involved in or need help with. Um, and uh, we never know, but we may get what I call other duties as a sign. Sometimes I jokingly say to my staff, if you're in, an, in a meeting and someone thinks we work for them, then we do and assume that. Uh, and we'll be happy to help them do anything that we can uh, to achieve their mission uh, in with, with, with in reason. Um, and from time to time, the legislature has thought about assigning us different duties. The one thing that we do not do and have not ever done is we do not offer direct instruction. We've left that totally to our institutions. They're accredited to do that. And I like to say that we help our institutions do things they cannot do or should not do and then get out of the way. And that's been kind of our mantra for a number of years, but uh, that's a quick overview of the virtual campus and some of the things we're doing in distance learning and student services. Thank you, John. It's always fascinating for me to hear what's going on in Florida. Just uh, in Connecticut, our consortium started in 98, and so we've run parallel in, in many ways. So to see the evolution to where you've changed in 2012 to be the virtual campus, Again, exciting stuff. Just again, rem a reminder about the questions pod in the chat window. Um, and I, I can't wait to get to the next one. So without further ado, I'd love to hear about eCampus Ontario, Lena. The, the mic is yours. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for having me here and um, for bringing your Canadian colleagues into the mix. I'm so excited to be here with you and tell you a little bit about eCampus Ontario's journey as a consortia and the way in which we have found some early success in our first couple of years of operations. So the eCampus Ontario story starts in 2010. It's, it's much more recent than my other colleagues who were on the line. And this is a photo from 2008. This is post-economic crisis at a time when the government of the day was trying to move the province away from a dependence on manufacturing jobs. And so investment in the post-secondary system was top of the list and technology was seen as central to that effort. So the idea behind an Ontario online institute uh, was twofold. The first was to generate highly skilled jobs of the future. And the second was to attract international students. The government of Ontario, had, Ontario looked to Australia as an example and um, saw the kind of international profile that they were building and the, and the students that were coming into Australia to study. So the government created an organization which was designed to serve institutions and to pump up their online and technology enabled learning offerings. So um, next slide, please, Megan. Thank you. Um, so the government vision had some key features. The first is that we were to be nonprofit and publicly focused. The second was to be a consortium of member institutions governed by a representative board of directors. And just like John said, we are not, we were not to be involved in course delivery, assessment of students, or granting of credentials. That's seen as institutions business and one that they do very well. And it wasn't something that our member institutions were interested in having another competitor involved in. So we stay pretty clear away um, from those elements.
So Ontario is the largest province in Canada, which makes our consortium the largest in the country. In turn, we represent 24 public colleges, 21 public universities, and we serve just over a million students. We have a couple of other colleagues, um, consortia colleagues in British Columbia, Manitoba, and previously in Alberta who have very similar models, but Ontario has kind of come on to that scene um, with a different model, one that is more representative, one that is um, more based on the idea that member institutions all have an equal say and an equal voice in our processes. So our government gave us our mandate and uh, we got to work. So in 2011, we were incorporated. In 2015, we became operational. We were immediately incorporated, but establishing a board of directors and bylaws and a governance structure always takes some time. And it also took time for our member institutions to sign up and begin to participate. So in 2015, we had a small team and we had leadership in place. And by 2016, we had our first two year strategic plan, which mapped out some of our priorities. Those priorities had four principal elements, um, serving students, serving institutions, um, serving the province, and also serving um, our own operational needs. They were pretty, they were pretty routine, um, and they were also there just to kind of provide us with a platform on which to start to build support among our member institutions. So the first um, two years of operations, we set up a couple of key services to our members. Um, this is our web portal. Um, EcampusOntario.ca provides Ontarians with a single place to search all of the online courses and programs offered in the province. So right now we have 800 programs. Um, we have 16,000 courses in this catalog. And in order to be included in this catalog, a course or program needs to be defined as 80% or more content online. And those little um, icons circled in yellow represent different attributes of the course or program. And these attributes are really for student information. Um, it can tell students if a course is open enrollment, if it, they can start um, any day, or if there is schedule information they need to be aware of, if they can finish at their own pace, if the course has a compressed schedule, if the course has an open textbook, or if there is student loan eligibility for that course. And as I said, we're also working on surfacing schedule information that's available to our students so they can see when the course starts and when the next intake is. So member services like our portal is still a huge part of what we do, but we have a new strategic plan um, that runs from 2018 to 2021 that has moved us more purposefully into another space, which is more about leadership rather than service. And it's more about online and technology enabled teaching and learning. So I'm just going to run quickly through the three strategies that our new strategic plan has. So strategy one is about open teaching and learning. It's about building communities of practice around open and reusable curriculum materials and tools. And it's also about supporting our institutions through shared infrastructure to support OER development. Um, so this is, you know, um, infrastructure which allows the easy, easy authoring and, and publishing of open educational resources. It includes targeted development of resources which we shared across our system. And it includes community building events and activities activities to really spread the word about open education and open teaching and learning more broadly. Strategy two is about service to our institutions and, and to our province. It's about enabling shared educational technology and tools to reduce costs among our members. So very similar to what John was talking about, about procuring all sorts of things. We're just starting to get into that. Um, we're setting up a single sign-on federated identity management infrastructure for all of our institutions um, so that single sign-on access to the technology or tool is easy and seamless and um, so that all of our institutions are on equal footing about their access to these shared technologies. Um, we're also developing an academic protocol, which is based on this idea or this concept of moving from idea to scale. So it's a, it's a sandbox approach, which allows us to test the new technologies using action research in an educational technology sandbox so that we can prove value before rolling rolling out a service or a technology to the whole province. So it's trying to figure out how we move from idea to scale and how we empower our students and our faculty to um, engage and, and start to bring us ideas and generate ideas about tools or technologies that they would like to, to move forward. 
strategy three is about making sure that we spend our time thinking at that edge of what's possible. Um, it's about innovation and investment and research and development. A couple of examples about what we're working on in this area. Uh, we're very interested in student-driven innovation and we have something called the Student Experience Design Lab um, where we have 23 um, really engaged, incredible students who are prototyping and designing solutions to uh, what they call the pain points in their educational experience. What are the things that really, that really bug them that they think could be done better? And we um, engage um, human-centered design thinkers and experts in order to kind of help those students uh, prototype solutions to those problems. And that's what I mean when I talk about empowering students and faculty to move to scale. Um, we are looking at ways right now to bring some of those ideas that those students have generated into the classroom so we can start testing. And eventually it's completely possible that one of those solutions will become a province-wide shared service for Ontario. So I'm going to stop there so that we can have lots of time for questions. And um, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, this is the, the part where I really enjoy not only having the opportunity to listen to Thomas, John, and Lena talk about their experiences, but now to get to grill them a little bit and then turn it over to all of you and, and your questions. The, the first question that comes to mind, and I'm going off a little bit off script, but it was interesting to see that Thomas, your consortium came out of Regis, and then John, you have uh, University of West Florida now as sort of a, a, um, a supporting structure. I have a question for the two of you, and then I have a separate question for Lena, but for Thomas and John first. How do your supporting institutions, your universities, support or hinder your success in running the consortia? Are there any conflicts in being housed within an institution while serving a, a broader constituent base? Uh, either gentleman. Yeah, <laughs> sure, I guess I'll jump in there. Um, when we talk about support, uh, Regis has been fantastic in in recognizing that we are a department of the university, but giving us the, uh, taking off the handcuffs so we can be quick to market as things change. Um, and that means that we get the support of legal for contract, particularly within the consulting atmosphere. Um, we get uh, the, the ID and T department, which has all the instructional designers and technologists when it comes to perhaps developing courses for some of the partners. Um, we also get the support of the university, even in how we're funded. Um, most of the university, uh, well, all of the university is set up as far as its budget with uh, with the with what we call a, a fund 43 and we'll set up as a fund 10. So we we actually can use the proceeds uh, that are left over through the management fees to help either do R and D to improve the sites or to schedule um, uh, regional visits to meet with the member institutions to see how we can better support them. But ultimately. Uh, almost treating our department as if it was its own business entity to manage the consortium and giving us the, uh, really giving us the support to do so. If we did not have that and we needed to make um, decisions or we needed to move forward on technology and we had to go through the typical structure of maybe an IT roadmap initiative to upgrade the software within the university's uh, IT structure, uh, that might bog us down quite a bit uh, because we do have a number of things that come up. I mean, it's a, a website is a living, breathing, organic thing. It has issues and it has bugs and problems. And, um, and we have people that are on deadlines. We have calendars that need to be met and we've got billing that needs to get out. So by kind of setting us aside, even though we are a department and, and uh, John put it great, we're in the same boat. We, our paychecks say Regis University on them. So we are, we are um, at one point, some of us have been faculty. We've been in, involved in other parts of the university. Uh, so we get all the support uh, that we that we need, but also we have none of the handcuffs and we are set up pseudo independently to operate and manage the consortium so we can once again be quick with with responses that need to be responded to right away. Thank you. And John, you, you aren't always part of University of West Florida, right? That's where you currently reside. So can you talk a little bit about where you where your Florida Distance Learning Consortium resided, how uh, being stationed inside University of West Florida hinders or helps? Uh, sure. So, uh, yes, I've been a Tallahassee Community College Eagle, a University of Florida Gator, and I'm now a University of West Florida Argo, and at one point I was a state-level entity. So I've been a little bit of all of the above. Uh, 
I guess the good news and there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is when uh, I was not particularly attached to a particular institution, I was freestanding. It was easier for folks to view me as Switzerland. So essentially, as a, as an advocate for all of my institutions, colleges and universities, uh, I was viewed as as equally uh, just very fair and out there like Switzerland. So it was not really an issue. The closer you get to an institution, the more sometimes you could be construed or perceived as being pro one system over another, et cetera. So that's that can be an issue. Being attached to a university has given us uh, better access to uh, research and grant access that we may not have had freestandingly. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, um, you, sometimes the deeper you are attached to an institution, sometimes you're subject to those institutions' policies and financial issues. So when sometimes, for example, right now, when I do uh, a procurement exercise for a particular product or service, uh, when I was attached to a community college, they had much more flexibility with purchasing uh, technology than the universities have. So now that I'm on a university or attached to a university campus, uh, I'm subject to the procurement rules of what universities can do, which is limited or more limiting than a college has been. Uh, secondly, for me, since I'm a state level entity and we receive fundings from the legislature, if I want to request a legislative, make a legislative budget request from, for the legislative session, I have to go up through whatever machinery exists. So in this case, at the University of West Florida, I have to go through the Board of Trustees. Uh, then I move up to the Board of Governors of the State University System, which goes through the provosts. And then if I get through all of those hurdles, then uh, it can go to the legislature. and. You can imagine what the priority is on funding for me versus the general university priorities. So mm -hmm. when I was freestanding, uh, I could submit my own legislative budget request to the legislature directly as part of a system request. Uh, the bad news about being a freestanding entity was I was a line item in the budget and I was out there and it could be poached and shot at every year. But sometimes when you're attached to an institution, you're a little further down in the level of the institution worksheets and perhaps not as visible, visible and perhaps not as uh, vulnerable to those kinds of things. So there are pros and cons either way in those kinds of things. The, the Switzerland reference is what we use on a consistent basis for our Connecticut consortium. So, Lena, I'm going to ask a question that may or may not be relevant, but how did the exist, the current or the past eCampus efforts in Canada impact how eCampus Ontario was put together? Yeah, that's a good question, Kevin, because it is different. Um, all of the previous eCampus efforts in Canada have been it's very similar to what um, John um, and Tom describe in that they're situated at an institution. eCampus Ontario is a nonprofit totally independent, incorporated um, organization that sits outside of any government influence or any influence directly from an institution. So we are very independent. And I think that was, um, I think given the size of Ontario, I think that was a pretty deliberate, um, it was a pretty deliberate move on the part of the government. They have some very strong-minded institutions in this province um, who were who wanted to have a very obvious seat at the table and who did not want to have um, one institution seem to be favored and so we are outside of of all of that um, like the Switzerland model and I think it I think that it lends itself to real um, sense of collective ownership although you know some days there i wish that we had you know the hr system of an institution the procurement system of an institution even all of that administrative stuff we have to do completely on our own um, and it would be very nice um, sometimes to be able to tap into the systems that already exist you know we've been writing all of our procedures and policies from scratch since day one so it's been a lot of work up front but again i think that I think that concept of collective ownership um, and of equity and access to the funding that is associated with our initiative is has been really important component of our early success when we're asking institutions to work together because they're all coming to the table as equals. 
Thank you. One of the themes I heard is that, you know, the governance models that each one of your consortium have, and to piggyback on a question that Russ asked the audience, how do you gauge your your member institutions' needs on an evolving basis? How do you determine what needs to be revised or evolved? What do you? How do you decide what needs to be end of life? And anyone who feels comfortable in jumping in on that? This yeah, is John. Go ahead, John. Go. Um, I would well. There, we have we have a statute, and a statute requires us to do certain things, and those things don't change unless the legislature changes them. So there's those. There's a whole range of services and a whole lot of gray or open space for us to work in anywhere around those statutes with regard to programs and specific things and functions on our website. So from time to time, we will convene a, a representative group and put them in a room and say, you know, essentially, what kinds of things are we doing that we should no longer be doing and what kinds of things are causing you to stay up at night that you really need help with that we should probably know about. And so we can try to do those every couple of years. Uh, the other thing that helps us is since we meet with our constituents, uh, you know, three to four times a year, uh, we have a pretty good idea of what they're working on or what their issues are, some of which may be as a result of new legislation they're facing or whatever. So we try to respond in that way if there's a role for us to play in any of those conversations. Great. Thomas, you were going to Yeah, yeah. I was going to say our, ours, you know, goes back to the initial bylaw structures, right? How, how does change happen? Um, what is the process for change? Um, and ultimately, it involves, you know, advisory boards that, that are part of the consortium. Uh, we've got a presidential advisory board um, where a number of the presidents are in the consortium of these universities can come together and we can use them as advisors. But ultimately, the decision is still falls on the shoulders of the management team. So we can go to the presidential advisory board and say we'd like to, for instance, we'd like to let in a for profit entity to become a provider. Um, we'd like to see if there's any feedback, how do you feel about it, and given the opportunity. But once again, we, we remain independent to make those decisions as needed uh, for the for the good of the consortium, even though we do seek the input and ultimately if the president's advisory board or the provost's advisory board didn't feel it was in the best interest, and of course we wouldn't do it, but there would be uh, at least something where we can make decisions on some of the smaller actionable items. Uh, we do hold um, a yearly conference, uh, not only for the members, uh, but we also do a, uh, a provider's conference. We've got two separate conferences where everybody comes together. Um, this year we held it in Denver. and We can talk about uh, the different uh, issues that are going on within the consortium, but also the initial um, operational structure of the consortium where we are dealing with the liaisons of the universities that, um, that are the individuals, usually in the registrar's office, that are registering the students. Um, they are the boots on the ground individuals. They are the individuals that are in the trenches every day working with not only the leadership of the institution, but also the students that are looking to register for courses and they have the heartbeat of what's going on. And we're in daily conversation with them by having the management team uh, in place. And also, you know, we also do take the position of, of Switzerland. I like that analogy um, where we don't promote one provider and or member of the other. We're here to facilitate. Um, and that's evident in the fact that Regis is is number four on the providership as far as number of enrollments that it provides and the dollars that it earns within the consortium. So uh, we don't promote one or the other, but but structure in place in regard to um, the liaison and also through the bylaws. Lena, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I would just add um, from our perspective, you know, our decisions, our decisions are made by a board of directors. So we have a representative board of directors. Um, and I think that the really key there's two kind of key features of this board, which I think make it effective. Um, the first is that it, it's diverse. So we have, um, we have presidents, we have VP academics, we have students, we have faculty, we have members of the public, we have, um, you know, directors of teaching and learning centers, we have um, deans. So it, it has a whole bunch of different perspectives captured in it, and it's a mirror image um, college and university. So it's an 
a little bit of a larger board than I think most people would recommend. Um, but I think that diversity is really important. The second thing that that's really important for them to be effective is that they maintain a strategic focus. So operational issues are our space. Um, you know, we have a CEO. Decisions on operational issues are his. Um, but the strat the strategy of the organization um, is driven by that board of directors and they keep it at that level they keep it elevated and i think that is one way um, that we are able to navigate that space between you know not being hamstrung um, by process and and by um, being over consultative and still being able to move things along but also being able to um, serve our members and, and represent their interests there is a follow-up question from uh, William in the audience, you know, talking about how you are listening to your constituent basis and really gathering that information of what the needs are, but are, is there a point in time that you're ever pushing the agenda? You're proactively setting directions or strategies or policies uh, in trying to, maybe influence is too strong of a word, but um, affect change. Um, yeah. Can I take that? Yeah, I, um, we, sorry, Lena, please, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Ladies first, please. Oh, I was just going to say that. I mean, I think Kevin Ewan and I have talked about this before, about the balance between leadership and service. I think you need to maintain both. Um, but it's at, uh, for our on our end, I think we're, you know, we're heading more towards that, that balance um, of that prioritizes leadership. So we see about 70% of our activity to be pushing the envelope, where, um, whereas about 30% is service. So I think it's about being able to do both. Uh, agreed. We're, we're in the same boat, um, but also it's our duty um, to share the knowledge. And sometimes sharing the knowledge almost can be mistaken as uh, pushing an agenda. And I think uh, a good example of that is you know, the way that the consortium was originally designed was a supplement complement model, right? You have a student, he needs to, or she needs to graduate, and you don't have the course, you can go to the consortium, you can get it done, and uh, and the student graduates. And and the more that we started to travel and meet with the, with the schools and doing these regional visits, we came to find out that, like I said, there were schools that were using it very strategically, and they were earning big money off of it millions of dollars and setting it aside and then growing their own online programs and faculty loading and it had become sophisticated overnight without much influence from us. And so we felt it was our duty to share that information with other universities that we knew were struggling financially because we're in the independent space and we're not getting any state funding. Um, so sometimes, like I think Lena's right, I agree with her, there's a balance between leadership and service and sometimes that line seems to get blurred a little bit, like you might be pushing an agenda when when actually you're just trying to uh, give good information. Great. John, did, is there anything you wanted to add? I think they've stated it pretty well. I mean, I think it's, we see that as one of our primary responsibilities. We, uh, we often say, you know, sometimes our institutions don't know what they don't know. And one of our jobs is to, you know, to go to places like WCET and Educause and Gartner and lots of places around and try to learn as much as we can and see what's coming down the road and make sure that our smallest and largest institutions understand what the environment looks like, what might be happening. Uh, sometimes one of the most difficult situations or conversations that you can have or have to have is with somebody that you report to, or in my case, maybe somebody in the legislature who asks you about a difficult problem and you know where your institutions stand and you know it's a problem and then you get the question, what needs to happen here to fix this? And the answer might be pretty clear, but it might not be the one that your institutions want you to talk about. So um, it's a very difficult conversation sometimes in some of those areas, but in general, we try to advance the, the model as much as we can and help our institutions understand what's coming down the road. So I know we're right at our end of our our, our allotted time. I, I don't, Megan, I'm gonna call on you. There's uh, a a couple more questions they're specific to Thomas uh, are we out of time or do we have a minute if Thomas can answer quickly I think that's a great question to ask so go ahead and I'll just move through the slides in, in the background but please do ask so there are a, a couple questions but uh, the one that Russ had asked earlier is um, 
what is the process in deciding what the revenue share model is? Uh, how do you determine the splits, be uh, splits between the providers and the members? Okay, so that was done, and thank you, it's a great question. I know that sometimes how does one, we talk about mission and we talk about all these different pieces uh, that are feel good, and then you get it out of the money and sometimes people's feelings get hurt, right? Um, but originally the, the split was discussed within the original consortium uh, on what we thought operational costs might be. Um, and what that came down to, once again, in the independent space was what was the cost per three credit course? And on one side, you've got the providing institution paying a professor. There's different models, right? You've got some where they're getting paid per class and they're getting paid per ed. But ultimately, the split was negotiated with all the schools and was set in stone um, as it is because the schools on the member side um, have a tuition rate that isn't always the they don't always get what they ask for, right? So even though they're asking 1500 for the course with financial aid and all the other pieces that come into place in the independent space, they might actually be getting close to that 825 to $900 ticket. So that's really when we, in the early stages, we, we sat down with both sides and said, this is how we think it would be an equitable uh, split, even though the numbers don't match up because on one side, you've got member institutions pseudo buying students at times. And, uh, and since it's so different across the board, if we came up with standard solid rates and didn't fluctuate them, uh, then it would make sense for everybody. And then as we see changes year to year in the market and the cost structure, once again, the management team reserves the right to raise costs um, as needed to split within the consortium. Thank you. And I, th I want to thank everybody in attendance for um, going over time with us and joining us today. But it's been, uh, more importantly, I want to thank Thomas, John, and Lena for sharing their expertise today. I want to thank Russ and Megan and Tina for uh, putting this presentation on today. With that, uh, Megan, take us home. Great, thank you, and thank you all for participating. Thanks for the wonderful presentation, and thanks for your great job moderating, Kevin. We'll see you at the next WCT webcast. Bye, all.